Hi, I'm James Reynolds and I'm the director of the feature documentary Primum Non Nocero. First, do no harm. Before 1900, doctors had not understood why some transfusions caused bad reactions and even death. Landsteiner thought there might be different kinds of human blood. From studying these results, it was found that there are four different kinds of human blood, or four blood groups. Landsteiner's discovery solved one major difficulty standing in the way of successful blood transfusion, but another remained. Blood was uh, highly coagulable. The addition of citrate helped maintain the blood in a liquid fashion. Russian physicians pioneered the collection and storage of cadaver blood. A triumph in the study of blood is a new test that detects the mysterious RH blood factor. There are probably hundreds of blood types. The push to separate whole blood into its individual components really started blood banking. Blood plasma, a recent and important discovery of medical science, provides a permanent bank for use in transfusion. Furnished by volunteer civilian donors, the blood plasma may be stored indefinitely and given to any patient without risk. men and women are donating blood for the Red Cross National Blood Bank to furnish plasma for emergency transfusion. Researchers are now looking frantically for acceptable and plentiful substitutes for plasma. Instead of the traditional easily breakable glass bottle, whole blood to be shipped is today enclosed in unbreakable plastic containers. Dr. Cooley has done thousands of cases of cardiac surgery without transfusion. All these men down here, they only get $5 a pint for their blood, but we're striking this blood bank. You had virtually a 100% chance of acquiring hepatitis B from being transfused. We're going to have a million outpatient visits a year from AIDS and AIDS-related illness. I will do all that God gives us the power to do to find a cure for AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. That they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus. They took the product off the market in the US and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Every time we make blood safe, that step is going to add cost and at the same time may not guarantee us complete protection. If you get my blood, you will now have my DNA. So we are dramatically expanding the use of DNA evidence to prevent wrongful conviction. For the first time in its history, the National Security Council got directly involved in combating a virus, HIV. The government's scientific committee recommended the use of a filter for transfusion. When is the government going to react to that recommendation? Uh, that recommendation is obviously very important for the future of the blood transfusion service. I will look at it very carefully and I'll get back to it. 200 million units of donated blood are needed worldwide. 80 million transfusions are administered each year. The shrinking donor availability means global blood resources are in short supply. I'm joined by Richard Melsheth, the former executive director of the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, and my co-producer. It's been 10 years since the release of the documentary. 
It was shortlisted for the MIT TV Asia Super Pitch Awards in 2011. Let's screen the teaser. When it comes to blood transfusion, it seems as though we have not really understood in that we've never done the basic research to know when we're doing good and when we're doing harm. Transfusion alters a lot of things in, in the organism and it has long-term side effects. The recurrence rate is anywhere from two to three times more recurring cancer if you give blood than if you don't give blood. But that's a very frightening situation for those who go for cancer surgery. You give a bag of blood, and a bag of blood has all sorts of things in it, and we ignore, you ignore them. Blood transfusion has never undergone randomized clinical trials to the level at which a new drug would have to go through the FDA. It's never been done. Many clinicians think of blood and blood components as a drug to treat specific conditions that patients have. In fact, blood is an organ. It happens to be a liquid organ. This happens to be the only transplant that all you require is essentially a couple of letters behind your name and a pen, and you can write for it. They know not what risks and benefits they're likely to create or cause as they give this therapy. They've been essentially brainwashed by a public relations event that's gone on since their birth. И в Америке, и в России есть врачи ретрограды, которые за то, чтобы переливать кровь. И есть те прогрессивные которые говорят, что надо все больше и больше отказываться от переливания крови. А критерии к этому, наверное, и, да не наверное, это точно и у вас, и у нас сейчас одни и те же, которые вытекают из доказательной медицины, что надо отказываться от переливания крови. Every decision I make as a physician should, you would think, be based upon my in-depth weighing of the evidence of I'm going to do more good than harm if I take the following therapy. Avoidance of transfusion uh, as well as a, uh, or the possibility of reducing uh, exposure patients to allogeneic blood uh, certainly helps, if you will, restore some confidence by patients that they're going to get the best care. We as physicians have all taken a very basic oath, and that is a Hippocratic oath, and it's to try to do good for mankind, and it also has the corollary of first do no harm. Richard Melsheth, welcome. Together with the Society for the Advancement of Patient Blood Management, we worked on projects in China and Malaysia between the years of 2009 and 2012. With our superlative crew, we conducted and shot interviews in China, Finland, Ireland, India, Chile, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the United States. Why was this such a Herculean task? The film was intended to provide a, a global perspective because transfusion is global in practice and thus the challenge is global as well. So professionals in, in medicine, uh, surgery, uh, ethics, uh, blood banking from the United Kingdom, Greece, Germany, Australia, uh, Russia, Nigeria, the Philippines, China, Japan, India, and the USA were interviewed. And it was fascinating to learn their stories and the events that shaped their current practice into closer alignment with scientific uh, evidence and patient safety. Richard, was there one interview that you conducted that really impacted you? The interview with Dr. Slapushkin, an anesthesiologist from Russia, 
uh, I thought was most revealing. His experience working with miners in Siberia, where access to, to blood was limited, and yet those with life-threatening blood loss survived. Let's watch that sequence together. Произвел уникальную операцию, то есть невозможно было достать шахтера, он произвел ампутацию одной ноги, одновременно обезболил этого шахтера, одновременно ввел кристаллоиды внутривенно, а надо все это понимать, что это в условиях шахты, где пожар, где все падает, у него одна лампочка на лбу только, которая освещает, 10 часов, и этот шахтер потерял ну, более 75 процентов объема циркулирующей крови то есть критически тем не менее он 10 часов прожил этот шахтер его лечили и через месяц он правда на одной ноге но тем не менее он здоровым ушел домой уникальный случай и за этот случай вот этого врача руслана правительство наградило орденом вот в том числе из этого случая Я тогда сделал вывод и начал задумываться о том, что а зачем переливать кровь? Если человек прожил без переливания крови определенный промежуток времени, много часов, то какой смысл ему в дальнейшем переливать крови? Я не вижу этого смысла. И с тех пор, наверное, я начал этими проблемами заниматься в научном аспекте. In the early days of asepsis in Vienna, Austria, Dr. Schemmelweis noticed that the midwives had many fewer infections than did the physicians who often were touching many different patients or even actually coming from the morgue. The docs would go from the autopsy room into a delivery room, didn't change the gloves, didn't change the coats, didn't wash their hands, just went from one table to the other. The physicians had a horrible death rate related to post-delivery sepsis of the moms. Same population of moms, midwives were delivering mothers. Their death rate was much less. Semmelweis goes, well, why are they having less sepsis, less illness and morbidity? And made the simple observation that you need to wash your hands between patients. He introduced that idea to his team and said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna wash. Just use regular antiseptic uh, solution and wash, and his moms started surviving at much higher rates. There was no basis for anyone to believe him, plus he was a pretty colorful character, apparently, as well. And what he was suggesting just sounded outrageous, even though he did have evidence. He had data. Las observaciones de Semmelweis eh, son observaciones de sentido común, eh, son observaciones de la vida diaria, son observaciones de alguien inteligente que está tratando de ver algo y sin embargo en su tiempo fueron rechazadas, objetadas y, y, y su autor perseguido. He was drummed out of the business basically because it was not traditional. The uh, influence of the politics and the fraternity of medical professionals at the time was such that it was simply unacceptable to consider that anything so simple could be the reason for the difference in survival. People are actually thinking it is all due to demons or devils coming in, till a simple solution somehow is brought in of hand washing and that prevented all the sepsis. So that's a simple solution. So many things in medicine may have a simple solution, but people are reluctant to accept because something is simple. The Slimmer Weiss principle is the knee-jerk rejection of anything new uh, because, again, it challenges the norms. Now, that evolution of that thought of, well, there's a connection here, can I improve outcome? could actually translate into what happens in transfusion. It serves to illustrate the bias that we physicians have, which is that we really truly believe in what we know, in the way things are done now. And it's the biggest 
challenge, I think, to practicing physicians to always be aware of and awake to the possibility that something better is coming along, something new and different, maybe even something contrary to, to what we believe is the right thing to do. We have to always be open to consider a new idea, even if it flies in the face of everything we think is true. So again, the Schimmelweis reflex describes the, the rejection of evidence because it doesn't agree with previously held views. It's, it's unconventional. Also, the simplicity of a recommendation causes it to be ignored. And Schimmelweis was, was up against the politics and the fraternity of medical professions at that time. So is there a parallel today? Could the Schimmelweis reflex describe the reaction to bloodless medicine and surgery principles today? Well, interviews uh, with several of the doctors echoed this same observation. Uh, they thought so. Dr. Jonathan Stamler recently said, it's apparent that transfusion is associated with significant risk of morbidity and mortality, including heart attack, renal injury, and death. How does this statement tie in with the title of the documentary? First, uh, do no harm, part of the Hippocratic Oath taken by physicians, we believe framed well uh, the need to uh, evaluate and to revisit why doctors do what they do. And uh, blood donation and transfusion, while popular, uh, emotional, and, uh, considering, and considered a very noble uh, life-saving endeavor, merited a rethink in the light of emerging scientific evidence and so first, uh, do no harm, uh, what ethicist professor Ken Kipnis refers to as the, as, the, as the first principle of healthcare, better describe the aim and underpinning approach for this documentary. One of the most powerful revelations for many was Professor Stamler's groundbreaking research that banked blood is deficient in nitric oxide. It cannot vasodilate effectively to deliver oxygen. Let's watch that sequence. Hemoglobin doesn't just ferry oxygen from lungs to tissues and CO2 back, carbon dioxide back to the lungs, but it carries this third gas, nitric oxide, in a protected form, um, and it releases the nitric oxide together with oxygen. The nitric oxide then dilates the blood vessels so that the oxygen can get to the tissues. Um, what turns out is that our blood banks are deficient in nitric oxide. When you store blood in the blood bank, the red cells lose their nitric oxide and they are therefore unable to dilate blood vessels and oxygen delivery to tissues is thereby impaired. So the world's blood supply is deficient in nitric oxide and those red cells do not seem able to deliver oxygen in the same way as a fresh red blood cell is capable of. Another point, is bloodless safe or safer or more efficacious than blood transfusion therapy. In order to ensure that the right thing is being done, there should be a basis in fact for what the therapy or the intervention is going to be. This uh, concept of tradition-based practice and evidence-based practice is, is uh, quite the rage right now in transfusion medicine for the trauma patient. There are data in the literature to suggest that even transfusing patients bleeding from trauma leads to adverse outcomes. When we study groups of patients that have been transfused, they have a higher incidence of such things as infections after surgery, recurrence of cancer, lung disease and lung problems. Now, it's very tempting for all of us to then say, well, so it's proven, it's a cause and effect. But just by the way that kind of medical research is done, you cannot call cause and effect. However, let me point out to you that there is a place in the world where we've made that association and we have never done controlled randomized trials, and that's smoking. 
What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Tens of thousands of doctors in all branches of medicine in all parts of the country were asked that question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Yes, surveys show more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Smoke Camels, the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Does anybody watching this film have any doubt that smoking is related to lung cancer and emphysema? Yet, We've never taken two groups of patients, given them cigarettes or not, and said smoke for 50 years and let's see who comes out better. Can we give a transfusion and not hurt you? Can we do a clinical trial and demonstrate that a transfusion is no worse than not giving a transfusion? Or that you can transfuse more and not make you worse than transfuse less? No one, no one has ever said, let me give a transfusion and show that you could do better. No study is designed like that. Transfusion medicine suffers from not having a well-founded uh, scientific basis for the use of the therapy. When doctors don't know whether what they're doing is harming the patient or not, okay, they have an obligation to find out. Um, you've got practical disagreement among clinicians, okay, and yet one remains inside the standard of practice and the other is outside of it. Okay, so how do you settle it? A randomized clinical trial. Richard, let's go back to why we produced the documentary. The, the purpose of this uh, documentary was to learn how blood transfusions became embedded in clinical practices without the rigors of testing. For example, a randomized uh, controlled clinical trials to really measure its, its safety and efficacy. The primary audience was the public and really worked to explain in simple uh, clear as well as accurate ways the development of this fascinating therapy. And secondarily, but not any less important, was the medical community who already understands uh, much of this, but not always in the framework of first do no harm. What are the implications of becoming a blended animal, a chimera? There's been a number of studies shown that if you give a blood transfusion without reducing out the white cells, and still in the United States, 50% of our blood is given without reducing the white cells, you will become what is called a chimera. You will become a blended animal. You will no longer be a single distinct human being. You will be a multi-DNA animal carrying somebody else's DNA. How long, we don't know, but it's fascinating from the World War II group of veterans that still, some 50 years later, they still carry the DNA of the person that they were transfused from. We know today that a number of rare diseases are carried in your DNA. Your propensity for getting lymphoma, leukemia, something else, cancers may be affected by this your transmission of this may lead to any number of other diseases moving through a population. It's never been studied, nor do we have the foggiest notion about the effect of blood transfusion on what we call the epigenetics, the movement of these genes through a population. Have audiences benefited from the documentary? Dr. Ji Hong Wen, head of China's National Patient Blood Management Initiative, in a total of 26,000 hospitals nationwide recently said PNN has been played many many times not only in the Chinese Society of Patient Blood Management Congresses but also in many other circumstances it really helped people in China especially doctors understand the risks of transfusion and how bloodless medicine works it has made a great contribution to China's PBM program this year, the National Health Commission of the People's Republic of China has released guidelines for perioperative patient blood management. It is a health industry standard in China. We have made much progress with PBM. Thank you, Richard. We remember when China's Ministry of Health created the Department of Blood Management, and now Professor Xi leads this initiative in over 26,000 hospitals in China. China loves bloodless. Richard Malchef, thank you very much for your insights.
on the making of the documentary. In addition, I'd like to thank our investors, our outspoken interviewees, and talented crew for giving audiences access to a red-blooded story of life-saving importance. And we'd like to thank the organizing committee of the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Society for this opportunity.